All right, people, this is episode number three of the Union Tapes. And some of you might not be uh, too familiar with uh, this name. It's Greg Giot. He was one of the riders that got good as BMX was just dying off in the mid to late 80s. Greg moved from the USA to Holland, then to London in 84, which is where he really got into BMX. Greg became one of the founders and locals of the infamous Meanwhile Quarterpipes under the A40 in West London. And he appeared regularly in BMX Action Bike, Rad and Freestyle magazine. Also rode on TV's BMX Beat. He pushed the boundaries pretty far. And in this interview, we talk about how he got into BMX, obviously. Moving from Holland to London. Meanwhile, quarterpipes, Latimer Road halfpipe, Chinkford halfpipe, whole shot contests, BFA comps. Hope you enjoy it. <laughs> I know that you was originally from the US, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah so I, uh, I was. Uh, we lived uh, in a number of places till we actually moved here to Plano. But when I was ten, we moved to Holland for four years, and then after Holland, it was England for four years, and then back here. Okay, and you came from Texas to Holland. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wondered how, how you ended up there. So it was just two places. Yeah. Just US, two Holland, places. England, back to the US. Yeah. At what? Holland, uh, what were yeah, you? Go ahead. 10 years old? 10 years old. Yeah. <clears throat> so is that's where you dis- first discovered BMX? I, I had this, like, I was drawn towards towards bikes since I can remember. Okay. It started out when, uh, when I, like one of the first memories I have, I think I was three years old. We moved from Kansas to Dallas and there's this guy next door named Johnny. I remember his name. He had this motorcycle and I thought he was the shit. Right. And, uh, so I had this like little push bike thing and he would just ride his motorcycle around the house and I just follow him, you know? And it's just like, there's something with wheels. And then I think, then we moved to Plano when I was five. I saw this kid like riding a wheelie down the street and I'm like, Oh my God, you're God. That, that kid's God, you know? So I just, I like practice forever. Cause like here in the States, the concrete in the neighborhoods and the streets, it's like, there's these tar lines and then like 10, 15 feet of concrete, then a little tiny tar line and so forth and so forth. And I would just try to practice riding, see how many tar lines I could cross until finally I got forever. And like my friend's parents would be like, really, really holding up their beers in the air from their garage. But uh, yeah, so I've always loved bikes, but when we moved to Holland, they um they happened to build uh, a BMX track pretty close by to our house, and so I started racing, and I did that for I guess a couple of years, and I guess that's where I learned, started learning jumps and stuff, and then kind of bike control. Um, but one of the last races I went to right before we moved to England, there was a quarter pipe, and I'd never seen a quarter pipe before. And there's these guys going up to the top, you know, and then bunny hopping around nobody was getting air or anything but i'm like that is the coolest thing i've ever seen and it was kind of coincidental because as soon as i moved to england like one of the first things on tv was the kellogg's deal with okay like, uh, with like neil and ron was there yeah that's right and, 85 uh, yeah yeah and i was like it was just like everything was pushing me to go that direction then when i met i met neighborhood friends and they're all riding bmx's and stuff and then my dad uh got me i think a rickman freestyler yeah, and I, uh, I built a. There was something in a magazine on how to build a quarter pipe, so we built one of those little rickety, like four foot wide, just awful little ramps. And I rode that in my backyard, and that's when you know. Then the more I met people in that area, then uh, we ended up going to Meanwhile. And all right, how so? That's where it so when you moved from Holland to the UK, like you moved straight to London. How how different was London? Like what was that like back then? From uh, like Holland. Yeah. It was kind of insane, man. I was just like, I was, I've always been in my own little head in my own little world. And so it's, I don't really notice things. Like for instance, when we lived in the hall in one summer, my parents went on like this, you know, road trip around Europe. And so older looking back, it's like, well, all these cool things we saw, but all I wanted to do was every town we went to, I wanted to go to the cafe to find a pinball machine or a video game. So basically I didn't yeah. pay attention to anything. I do remember <laughs> it rains a lot in Europe. So yeah, <laughs> it rained in Holland. It rained in England. It's pretty much the same, except it was more of a city situation. It was kind of West London, so yeah, it wasn't yeah, wow. necessarily downtown or anything. 
and we had the like it's Chiswick, so we had the little park around the corner of the tube station, the church where we rode flat in front of. But from there, you could, you could, uh, we took the Metropolitan Line, I think, to to Royal Oak for Meanwhile too. But you could actually you could just ride there. Every all the spots you could basically ride, except for like South Sea and Romford, you got to take trains and stuff. Yeah. So, so you didn't notice any difference in like whereabouts in Holland was you? Uh, in a little town called Vorburg. It's like right outside the Hague. Okay, yeah, I know. I know where the Hague is. Yeah. Okay, so he's like near Rotterdam. I mean, it's Holland. It's tiny. Yeah. It's by everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so yeah, so London wasn't like you didn't you didn't pick up on like the the sort of the vibe that was that was going through London in the eighties. Things it was quite, pretty crazy in West London at that point. But I know you was in Chiswick and like I'm, like not yeah, in Hill and just, stuff. It was, was, the neighborhood friends you know and yeah. the only thing i heard of like anything i never paid attention to tv so anything political climate i wouldn't have known i know that um we would the, well, the two things i remember is getting called bmx bandits yeah that's and it, yeah. people calling each other kevin sharon yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that sounds about right so <clears throat> let me just uh flick through this so you arrived in london in 85 yeah that, that would have been 85, uh, that Kellogg's. 80, 84-ish, 84. Okay. So that Kellogg's was 85. Um, oh, all right, well. Under 84 then, maybe. So, I don't know. so your first experience with BMX in London was uh, w was you made a quarter pipe. You met some friends, and then you made your own quarter pipe. Yeah, it, it, it initially started off with kind of a flatland fascination because I still had the quarter pipe in my head from from the last race in, in Holland. And then, um, yeah, we built the rim. But I think the very beginning of it was when I started meeting people there, um, they were talking about this dude named Yan, Y-A-N, Yan, and he was from France and he was like a flatlanding god. And so one day he came by and it was like, we're like, Yan, do tricks. And he did a cherry picker, and then he did a roll back into a 360, and we're like, whoa. So it started off mostly as Flatland before I encountered Meanwhile. And, you know, I don't know if, if the ramp was at the same time. If not, it was shortly after. Um, but it was always about the Flatland, dude. I get those little, you know, those little Skyway pegs that just, like, freaking grind right off your axle after a week. Yeah. And getting the back, back hops on the pegs to start it out. And then uh, there was, like, some kind of contest in somewhere in England, and uh, – Carlo and Craig were doing a demo and I entered that and it was in Bristol, I think. And okay. there was like 50 people or something that entered and it was like, you had to do mandatory ground tricks or whatever, but it was like first experience with a competition. But I watched, uh, Carlo and Craig riding. And I remember what little airs I did on my quarter pipe were like, I like, go up and like just do silly variations or whatever. And they landed the flat bottom. But when I saw Carlo and Craig, the way they went up the ramp, it came down the vert front wheel first. That's like the first time I ever saw how to actually air smooth. For that, it was like, like it, even in the beginning at Meanwhile, dude, it's like dude, any variation three feet out land at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, the friends that you built a quarter pipe with, did, they didn't come to Meanwhile, or they did come to Meanwhile with you? For you dude. What's up? They're coming for you. <laughs> I wonder what he's on They're about. Me. <laughs> yeah, the, the guys that you first rode with, did they go to Meanwhile with you? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was a shout out to James Saka, Church Stewart. Yeah, I know those but guys. Yeah. I know Shaka yeah, and, yeah. and Churchill. Yeah, hell yeah, man. Shaka, Shaka's the shit. I love Shaka. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. I mean, it was a week. not every time. I would think they went to Latimer Road more often because it was closer. It was literally like a ten minute ride from the house. Eventually, Latimer Road. <laughs> but um, yeah, they came here. They came there here and there but a lot of times i ended up just kind of like going by myself because i wanted to ride those ramps you know and it's under the underpass didn't matter the weather it was a, it could be like 20 degrees outside we're all riding in t-shirts because you know when you're young and you got that heat yeah. going so you went to meanwhile skate park first right yeah and that's where i went with that yan guy that i was talking about the first time i went and the first time I went, I immediately got off, got out of the, the tube station and had my bike stolen. There's just uh, these kids come up and go, oh, do this, that, and they got like knives and stuff. Like, oh, yeah, this is fun. But I was all young. And then it broke my heart, dude, stealing my yeah, bike. Yeah, fuck yeah. I've had but, a bike. Uh, but uh, that, then I learned about, you know, 
dangerous areas and in the future we all you know go in groups of 10 to 20 or whatever we did but yeah you got yeah, wise I mean, to it was the first place and that's where we, i met like junior and carl and and nick aka howard and howard's bike i think he had a, a quad angle at times like yeah. orange or white or something yeah that's right oh yeah. that's cool and then that bowl where they put the little they had the little wooden extension nothing nothing was like really hurt there at all man but they put that little extension that was just fun to jam around on but i'm glad we ended up going so meanwhile, too, and making that happen because meanwhile, one was just like, yeah, if you want to get robbed? Let's go. Meanwhile, one. Yeah, he, he Howard sent us some nice pictures actually of uh, Meanwhile One. He's he's on nice. that he's on that bike, yeah. We um, and the extension oh, as well. He found some shit then because he's always talking about, oh, I don't have that anymore, I, dude. That guy's got <laughs> so much video and pictures. I'm telling you, it's around somewhere. He wouldn't have let that shit go. I've got some pictures. I'll send them to you tonight because he sent me some the other day. Ones that you probably right, have right. not seen for years, yeah. So he came through okay, nice, cool. yeah. Um, so, so what you had to get a new bike. Where, what shop did you go to to get a, a new BMX? Dude, I, I honestly must have like I tell you, you know, my memory is terrible. But I think the next one was a, a Trickstar, which I got. I must have ordered through a magazine or something, but. I'm trying to remember if it was string on because that's yeah, that's one of my earliest bikes. So I think it was the Rickman and then the Trickstar. I might be wrong, but it was that like that blue Trickstar. The candy blue. Know, used to, what's that? The ca candy blue one. That was like the famous yeah, one, right? Yeah. yeah. So but yeah, you had a no, white. That's the one I, I wrote in early contests when I started competing. Pretty sure. I, I know there's footage of me failing at Flatland on that bike somewhere on YouTube. Okay, so the first picture I saw. Let me. I've got it here. Actually, was um. Oh, you, was it a green and white bike? Yeah, you was on a green and white. Um, where is it? Let me find it. Hold, hold on, was Greg. That a church star? Yeah, because I, I distinctly remember that picture because that's that's the first time I'd seen. Meanwhile, and I was like, "Well, where? How are we gonna get here?" Okay, is that the, if that's the double step off on the right? Yeah, that's it. Head, that was my that was like my first pick ever. I couldn't believe I couldn't believe it, dude. Or no, it was uh, it was either the Canyon or that one. I think it was that. It one. was this one. Is but, the uh, first one. That, yeah, that was the first time. Meanwhile, was in the mags. Yeah. Okay, so I must have had that bike before the blue one, but I, I guess I stuck with Trickstars twice in a row, which I snapped both. Yeah, that's definitely a Trickstar. Yeah, with a, it looks like right G, GT tires and green tufts. It looks like so. So yeah, I just I just wondered where Alpine Action wasn't selling BMX parts at that point, right? They'd gone. Do what now? At the, there was a shop in Notting Hill called Alpine Action, but I think they might have been gone by that time. Oh, dude, yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't remember. The only actual shops I remember were like skate shops. <laughs> I don't remember any BMX shops at all. So I must have got all my parts from either friends or ordering them. I was going to say online, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it would have been Young's. You remember Young's, right? No. Near, near Andy Brown's house, like uh, Lewisham. That that was uh, the hot shop at one point. It was called right Young's, and it was yeah. uh, it was at the top of Lewisham High Street. Yeah, and, and M Zone was another yeah. one. You remember them, right? I remember all my friends buying buying parts and stuff, and then I'd be like, "Oh, I broke this, got an extra," and everyone always had a spare. All I right. don't remember going to a lot of bike shops. Wow. At all. Amazing. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, bike shops. <laughs> they was on their way out by that I point. You, I support you fully. I support you fully. So the first, that magazine pick, the uh, the No Foot Can Can on the White Hutch, was that TLB that took that picture? Uh, I don't know. I think it was the, it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It must have been. It must have been him. So, so how would sure it was because he was. The, I think he went down there a lot, and so, uh, then Nick showed up every <laughs> once in a while, and then uh, I think Tim Tim's the one who did the interview with me as well. And one of the, the words with Greg. Yeah, that's right. Whatever. I've got that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Over the phone that was weird. So that was that the first day that the quarter pipes were rideable. Um, I don't think so. I think it had already been like. Like word of mouth about the spot had been gone out, and that's how he got there. So I'd already been riding, like at least a couple months, I would think. Okay. That was the that was the stage where it was like, do any variation land at the bottom still? Yeah, no, no. Let's yeah, you can kind of 
you can kind of tell where you progressed quite quickly after that. But Howard told us a story how he called the magazine and said, we've built a quarter pipe, you should come and check it out. And he said it was the same day as the Jason Hassel um, feature from Meanwhile. He had a feature in that. I don't know, I think he, yeah, but it had been there. It had been there for a little bit because I remember having gone there for a few times before Hassel showed up. Okay. And Hassel, you know, it's like, oh, it's Jason Hassel, man. That was pretty badass. Yeah. But nobody really talked to anybody, though. He was just like riding and getting pictures taken, I think. And he did what he got that no handed cowboy. Yeah, that's mag. it. Yeah. Yeah. That's in that right. same mag, yeah. Um, did, did you like no other crews of riders in London at that point in time? Did you know the South Bank lot and those guys? You know what? We, we never did much hanging out. If we met other crews, it was um, they. Where I met other people from the crews was usually Chingford, man, or sometimes Romford. But okay. we didn't often ride together. Everyone had their. Uh, yeah, everyone seemed to be like, I think, like, didn't like Jess. Jess had his ramp and him and Craig and them hung out and then Jason Lund had his like own little group yeah that's right I mean, yeah. I mean we did and then my crew was the Chiswick crew and the Meanwhile crew and it was basically the same people over and over so when I met up with other crews it was it was uh, you know I'd see people at Contest or Chingford possibly Rompert and surprisingly a lot of people did not show up at Meanwhile too at least when I you know it might have been while I wasn't there but a lot of people I, I never saw down there like yeah no down there Fraser was down there all the time yeah yeah you're right whenever I was there it was never like the other like the other groups of people who you know some of them like the older pros I would say like Jess and Craig and like yeah Jason Lunn and those guys yeah they used to come to Chingford but they never I never saw them at Meanwhile or any any other sort of there was guys from Croydon at Meanwhile and there was guys yeah. from like Kent as well. And then there was like people from East London and people from Essex, but they were all like you say they were they were a bit younger than those older guys. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe Craig and them are elitists. <laughs> <laughs> I just think they was they they, they was on a different path, you know. But did did you see that as like did you see that at the time that you you guys as you was like coming through? Did you did you see like a, a separation between like your group of riders? who was like basically coming up and those guys that were already sort of at the top. Could, did you see a separation uh, there or was it no? There was, there was no real separation except that they were, um, they were just like, they were known and they were good and they competed and stuff and they got in the magazines a lot. And so when I like me personally, when I was writing, meanwhile, I was trying to get to that level. I was trying to, you know, catch everyone and get to that. So maybe I get a chance to hang out with Mr. Craig. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which I did eventually. Troy Fraser took me to his house one time, and we were like very quietly rode their backyard. Me and Craig rode the backyard half pipe for about half an hour, and like barely said a word to each other. <laughs> it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's cool. So, so you used to go like after after you'd ridden Meanwhile for a while is when you started going to the UK BFA contests like regularly. Yeah, like I said, I think it was that Bristol one was the first one before I was really riding, riding, and then spent time, once I felt like I was getting better, once I'd learned to be smoother, get higher, and meanwhile, then that that was fun, man. It's like, I love I love contests. I didn't like wearing helmets, but it was like, it was it was awesome, because you know, we're just, I mean, BMXers, we're our own people. Yeah. When you go to a contest, that's where you get to hang out with people that you don't hardly ever get to see, you know? And just, I would go to the contest mostly, mostly because I'm like testing myself to see how well I do at first and then but mostly it was just to hang out with the other riders and watch the other riders and meet people and stuff it was pretty badass I love them it's like contests with like regionals would be three or four months apart or some shit and I'm like or regional or nationals would be three or four months apart and like man when you're when you're young it feels like three years and just waiting for that next contest to just go hang out yeah I remember a regional in South there was one in South London that I went to that you you was at you guys all, all went there. It was like Catford or somewhere like that. Because there was hardly yeah. any in, in London, in the London area, remember? You had to go like yeah. miles. like. But yeah, I remember that one. I think it was Catford or Bro Broccoli or somewhere like that, yeah. So so do you you went, you didn't really go to South Bank very often. I think that's where we was, yeah? Yeah, yeah, no. Um, South Bank, it wasn't really my thing. I wasn't much of a street guy. Okay. You know, so like the, the 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 banks. I mean, not putting it down. It's a cool little spot, except for 
you know, all the dude, the homeless people you had to ollie over or ollie and bunny hop over. But, uh, it was, uh, it was just the banks were small, you know, I, I, I went there probably more often with my skateboard than I did my bike. <laughs> oh, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, I thought you might have rode flatland there cause you had a big flatland scene at one point. Yeah, no, the, the, most, of the, most of the flatland I did was in Chiswick. It was either in front of the little church by the Turning Green Tube Station or in the park in the covered parking lots as long as we could before we got kicked out by security. Okay. So, yeah, the, when I was saying earlier about, like, the, 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 like, older pros, like the already established pros and you guys, this is how I saw this thing was happening, yeah? So you guys were, like, coming up fast underneath them, like, like the Meanwhile guys, Mike Cannon, like the Hudson brothers, like that's like that's one block, like, like Jason Ellis, like you guys were underneath, but you was coming up, and you, the way that yeah. that I used to see it because I was young was like those guys were like of a an era that was already established, but they their era was very different. It was like uniforms, like the music was kind of like fun, and it wasn't really that aggressive. But then like. With you lot, you had like this this thrash metal thing going on and this like no pads, jeans, t-shirt, just like it was gnarly. It was just so different to, to how I saw the other guys like that was already up there. So it, yeah. I could see that like yeah. breaking through, you know? Yeah, no, uh, it was like I said, man, it was like they were, they were the gods. It was so, the strange thing because, you know, like the group of us that you're talking about, that we're riding on that level, trying to catch up to them. Um, by the time we, we were getting close, it's like they kind of dropped out of the scene. It seemed like yeah. like Craig wasn't like riding anymore. And I don't think I've maybe seen Jess ride once, you know? Yeah. So, and, uh, I guess maybe what you're talking about is the, the difference in clothing is just, I, I think every time we saw those guys, it was either at a contest show or a magazine. So they had to wear their sponsors, Uniform seven shoot, I did it too, man. I wasn't even sponsored by anybody. I was wearing yeah. pants and all that. I thought it was badass. But um, yeah, man, we just that's kind. Of, I've never heard that before. That's cool. I mean, we just showed up wearing whatever we wear. Yeah, no, no, I because I, I was a, a couple of years younger than you guys, so I always was. I was taking all that stuff in, like, like deep, like this. What's going on, and what what's happening there and there and there. And I used to see those guys a, a fair amount. And like you say, they didn't wear that stuff when they were just riding. But that's how yeah, yeah. how I, we perceived them because we'd seen them more in magazines than any anything else. Right. But yeah, so yeah, so um, so you you after so say can you just run through the meanwhile stuff again? Like, so you had the you guys built the quarter for for no money, right? Oh yeah. So it I'm was stolen. All stolen wood. Yeah. Um, and it was mostly Nick, John, Junior, and you. Yeah, and there was Carl. And I know I'm forgetting people, man. I, 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 I apologize to anyone else involved. Just like my brain is so scrambled over the years. I forget stuff and time sequences and stuff like that. But yeah, it was just a small group there. And uh, we, you know, we, we go and we, uh, steal the wood from like down the road. There was like these department stores and they had fences up and there was stuff inside. It was, the buildings were condemned. They hadn't been used for a long time. So going up the stairways, like stairs were breaking and it was, it was scary, but yeah, all the wood was free. And it was, uh, John was, John was architect. I remember John doing the most work. I mean, for the most part, I ever just like held the wood down while he screwed it into the two by fours underneath in the frame. And, and might have put a couple screws in, but John was the one that was always there with the saw and the and the and the and the hammer and nails and the screw gun and all that stuff, getting it prepped up. Okay. Sure. Yeah. yeah. It might have been Nick and John's idea, but I just remember John being sorry, Nick, if, if that's the case. But I, I remember that being like John's baby, like twice. All on right. The other ramp as well. <laughs> all right. So so did Hounslow come after Meanwhile? Okay, Hounslow. That was before Meanwhile, as I remember it. Um, and I forgot when we were talking about Meanwhile too for your last project there. I forgot Chris Thomas and Jason Greaves. So what up, Jason and Chris? Uh, it was Jason was one of my early, uh, just basically riding around town, flatlining here and there, buddy. He told me about that Yan guy. 
And I think because we were looking for a place to write, told me about Hounslow. So we went there, and this was before, uh, you know, a year or two later, it ended up being like on towards the street more side of the track there, the BMX track in Hounslow, was where they put the little tiny quarter pipe, then a little concrete strip, and then the larger quarter pipe. But that larger quarter pipe used to be on the back side away from the street, the back side of the track. And I remember showing up there, and Chris was smooth. He was getting a little bit of air, and he was like doing can cans with her fairly new. And I'm like, whoa. And so there was a lot of riding Hounslow that went on um, before Meanwhile, I'm pretty sure, because I think I, I remember seeing Chris there and doing a lot of time there before that. And then it was just became a back and forth thing. Sometimes we go to Hounslow, sometimes we go to Meanwhile, because you, you know, you get bored of one spot too many days in a row type situation. But Hounslow was special, man. Hounslow was really special. I probably had one of my best PMS career memories there ever. It was just a good place to <laughs> Well, so I, there's a, I've seen a few pictures of you riding Hounslow. Have you seen them pictures, black and white? Yeah, there was some There was some dude that was a, just a random guy, I think, who was a photographer. Yeah. And um, he even gave me a printout. I had like this printout with all these different little pictures on the printout that he, that he gave me. It looked like a, a proper film printout thing, not just like on paper or something. But yeah, I, and it's that's weird because that guy just came out of nowhere and then before you know it, there's there's these pictures, but yeah, those are pretty rare. So, so did you? I've heard a story also. I think it was on Facebook where someone was saying that they they was there one day when you was there and the rally team was there. Oh wow! Is this yeah, true? See, and I, then, I, I've heard that story, and I don't. It's it's not true in the sense because what I heard was that it was raining. That's and it. I knew that Sam. What's his name? Sam what? Sam Wood. Sam Wood. Okay. Oh God, that's. Yeah, and that, that he was there or something, and I was riding in the rain, and I was trying to show out for him because I was trying to get sponsored. Dude, I was never trying to get sponsored, and I'm not, like, <laughs> covering my tracks. I didn't know this until, like, two decades later or whatever when I when I read that, but I just rode to ride. But what's weird is, like, I think I did end up – I did end up riding for Rally, if you can call it that. I think I was on – I can't remember what bike I was on, but they basically just slapped a Rally sticker on whatever bike I was on, which was not a Rally. And I did some shows with uh, Damon Nichols and Jason Lund. Oh, okay. And, uh, but I, I, I don't know if it stemmed from there. I think it stemmed from there was another contest where where um, it was a, it was a it was a badass contest, and I think I was approached after that by Sam. But I don't think it had anything to do with Hounslow. And that that Hounslow ramp, dude. Have you had, did you ever ride? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went there. Yeah. All yeah. right, man. That transition. It's like it's like. Okay, here's a normal transition, nice and smooth. You cut it with, you know, the way you design it, and you cut it smooth. That ramp went like, kink, right? <laughs> well, there was the small one, wasn't there? So it was it was yeah, hard to ride because there was a little one at yeah. one end and then the strip and then the eight foot, right? And it was metal. Right, yeah. So you just do a little baby turnaround air on the – dude, that, that turnaround quarter pipe, what was that, like two feet wide or something? <laughs> Was it even four? I think it was like three feet wide. It was like, what, four or five feet tall max, but that yeah. was just a little turnaround ramp. But then you haul butt at the Hounslow ramp and just like, kunk. <laughs> that transition was just messed up, dude. I don't know how anyone ever read it and then went back to a regular quarter pipe, but it was fun to hang out there and yeah, what, so this on. So who did you, you ride there with the same people that you rode everywhere else? There, there was no like locals at Hounslow that, that rode them quarters, right? Not really. I mean, there were locals there, but I think most of them races the race mostly on the track. But Chris Thomas was the dude that I rode with there. But we did plenty of times. Um, you know, I, me and Lee and Andy went there. And Nick was there a few times. We we just like let's go let's go to Hounslow type deal and we session it. Make a change, but yeah. There was that wasn't like there wasn't a, a huge scene there or anything. So so how what Chris for the most part. So how well did you uh, get to know um, Damon Nichols and Jason Lund? Not very, man. I mean, you know, it turns out Jason's a really good guy and everything now. But back then, he had kind of like a reputation as a hard ass, and he like he was a loud mouth a little bit. Sorry, Jason. <laughs> and so I just like I kind of stood stood away from him. I also there was like something about the Skyway team too, that seemed like untouchables. Am I right? I mean, yeah. they're always there with their, up their badass three beats eventually and, and their color schemes. And it's like, there was like Damon and Tony, right? Fraser wrote for the bit, Craig, Carlo. And, um, it was just like, 
I would, I was intimidated. So I didn't do a whole lot of talking. I never did a whole lot of talking anyway, unless I was like really tight with somebody. So like when I did those shows, I, I it was probably just a couple of shows. So we go to some town, set up quarter pipe, ride for an hour. So that's all it was. But yeah, I didn't do a whole lot of chatting. Yeah. People mostly because I was intimidated. Mostly because I was intimidated because I was like, oh, man, these guys are like established. They ride for Skyway, man, you know? <laughs> yeah, uh, that, but that was what it was like then, you know, that, that, that they did have that stigma. I remember um, Jason Lunn used to get, yeah, he used to get a bad rep for when he used to go to Chinkford as well. But, yeah. Right on. I heard he, I heard he bashed some, like, some shit talker at South Bank. The story goes like someone who was trying to steal his board or something or talk about him, and he took his skateboard and turned it around and, Smack the guy on top of the head with his trucks. <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, he. Yeah, I, I know. I know exactly what you're talking about with the uh, Skyway Sorry, team. I keep bringing it back to skateboards. <laughs> no, it's all right, man. <clears throat> all right, so, so did you uh, like after like you? So you started getting. Did you? You wrote a whole shot, yeah. As in the contest. Oh, okay, dude. Good tie into Sam Wood. This is what the most embarrassing moment ever i like that my i wrote two whole shots in all and the first whole shot was when i had just you know had gotten some pictures in magazines in radis unlimited and that and um could ride really well at meanwhile and could ride really good mostly anywhere but there was something about the ramps at whole shot that were completely strange to me it was uncomfortable and i could barely get any air and then there's sam wood who was doing the announcing right and he's like oh i know this guy greg yeah man it's badass get ready crowd and everyone's like cheering and then i'm going out there and i can't do anything. i got booed man <laughs> i don't know if there's footage of that i got booed at my first whole shot because i couldn't ride for crap man so i had to make up for the next whole shot which i did thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah i remember the, the the next one was because i think didn't lee lee wrote that whole shot as well and he he didn't ride very good right no, he rode. He rode well. He went. Uh, he rode for. Um, he he's running for Hutch, and he, he the, tried that nine, man. The first, That's no, the first one, out, like at the very end of his run. The the one uh, before, the the one before the, the one, one before. Yeah. Oh yeah, no man. I don't. I just, dude. I remember that for just watching everybody else, and then like completely failing on my run while Sam was trying to build me up. Like, dude, I was thinking in my head, be quiet, Sam. Jesus Christ, I'm obviously not riding well. Anyway, but yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't. I'd, uh, I. Th I think pretty much my friends rode decently at that first one. And that, what was that? Dennis McCoy was that that one? Or was it Wilkerson? That's not the flag. I think the first one was the Haro team, right? The the first one was Wilkerson and Rich Segura. Well, not the first one. The second one with with Americans coming over was Wilkerson and Rich Segura. And then we had McCoy. And Dino DeLuca. Okay. Which I remember McCoy at the Worlds. And I remember him at one of the whole shots. He was, he was doing that, that that forward side glide stuff. And yeah, the fast flat land. It was like multiple boomerangs. Yeah, fast flat land. Like really well in advance and blowing everyone's brains. So so the one after, Wilkerson was back and they had the half pipe. That's that's the one you rode good at, right? Craig, is that the one Craig flew out on, on the half pipe in the back? Yeah, yeah. Is is that that's the one that you rode that, that you said you rode good at? I, yeah, that's yeah. That was my that was my second and last one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that was the last one. Yeah. <clears throat> so from like around that period of time, like half pipe riding started coming in. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we had already had we already had Chingford, and then I think the guy who built the ramp initially, or mainly, was. Paul. Yeah, that's Skater. it. Yeah, yeah, Paul Wright. Yeah. And um, I guess he he, made, he extended it. So he made it bigger. And then they had that little small extension on the side. Yeah, that's right. And um, so that's where I started. That's pretty much where I got my first feel for half pipes. And then uh, I heard about Latimer Road. And that was like, you know, as far as I knew, the biggest ramp in England. I mean, that thing was huge. Yeah, it was. And, yeah. I mean, it's, it was so close to my house. I mean, that's where I ended up riding a lot. Had a weird experience on that ramp too, dude. The, the Bones Brigade came to town, and they had a, like a secret show. And I don't know how everybody found out about it, but like I didn't know about it. I was just going to ride Latimer Road, and um, I see these these guys are like blasting airs, and they're badass. And then 
and we get closer and then like like there's this whole crowd on the side of the ramp and apparently oh it's a secret bones brigade show and like but i gotta i, I want to ride so i can <laughs> <laughs> and in between you know, like i guess it was like caballero like just flew out on the deck and i like, get on there and there's just the entire crowd booing because you know that was like the BMX versus skaters back then. Yeah, yeah. everyone booing their asses off, dude. And I just like I just you know got up, pumped a couple times, got up on top, and uh, the, they were like, "Hey, what's up, dude?" They were totally cool because you know the skaters and the riders never had an issue with anybody. It was always like the fans type deal. That that the, all the the crowd was like full on skaters, and they're like, you know, fuck this BMX dude. But then I started getting some air and doing some stuff, and then. I remember Caballero, like, I leaned over, like, he's like, he's like, it's rad, man. Like, thanks, dude. And then they shut up. <laughs> so that, was, that was interesting. That was an interesting time. Oh, man. Oh, I forgot to uh, – I need to touch on this one as well. Pop out itis. Right. Uh, yeah. So that would have been quarter pipe days, yeah? Yeah, that started it meanwhile, for sure. Okay. That was um, – it was just – I don't know if I was just kind of burning out on riding so much. Because like once when I like in one year I went from getting three feet to like eleven feet at meanwhile, and it was just constant riding, constant practice. Like I you know get home from school, take the middle ball to line to Royal Oak, and ride, ride, ride until I'm tired and then go home. And did that day after day for a while for a long time. And um, okay, I lost my train of thought. So so <laughs> explain explain oh, to so explain to him what pop out itis pop out itis is because most people ain't gonna know. It's right when you get when you're hauling ass at the ramp, and right at the last second, uh, you decide to fly out instead of doing air. And like I said, I think that came from from burnout and just repetition. It's like do I like it's subconscious. It was a subconscious thing, and I couldn't explain it. That's why I wrote the freestyle magazine about it. And um, that's funny because when I did that, they actually printed the letter and then I had people come up to me and say dude I've got the same thing and then it was like all of a sudden a thing and I felt better because it's like well I felt bad for everybody who's got it but it's like okay I'm not alone you know because people were experiencing it but yeah it's just you you, you want to do an error and then all of a sudden you're like no I don't and you fly out the very last second and the worst the worst thing is is when you decide too late like when you're already going like 30 miles an hour at the ramp and you're at the lip and then you decide that's kind of not a good thing. <laughs> so, so how often did that? To get it right before. So you you jumped off like from a high air. I take it like so you bowed a high air. How how often did that happen? Like too late. No, it uh, too late. Not a lot. Just a handful of times. It's usually before. And then the more I started thinking about it, I'd be pedaling towards the ramp, and already it's in my head. You know, and then it's just the you know, yeah. foregone conclusion that it's not going to happen. And I mean, there was when I came back to the states. I never ever got rid of it. I had my own backyard ramp, and and even at contest, man, I have to have like, you know, I'd have Dennis McCoy put his bike sideways along the coping, and then Matt would be on the other side with the bike right along the coping. If something was in my way, then I could do airs, and I wouldn't think about it. But when there was like just coping and space in the background, and more than it's like fifty fifty <laughs> that I'm going to fly out. So I. <laughs> And it was cool because it kind of became a thing. They were, they didn't mind, and I appreciated it. I felt bad about it, but I mean, I had to do something. I'm at this contest. I got to ride. I'm not just gonna fucking fly out all day and do lip tricks. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that lasted for a couple of years. If there was no bike on the platform, yeah, that was for a year or something. Much, um, ever since I wrote that letter of freestyle, I don't know what year it was, but it's pretty. It's before I went back to the states, and then, um, and then every every it's like. The entirety of the time after it. Some days were just good days, and you wouldn't think about it. But then, for the, the rest of the time, like ninety percent of the time, it's there in your head, or it just occurs, even when you're not thinking about it. It's just it's a shitty thing to have. I don't know. I don't know who put me in touch with him, but like uh, Tom Dugan called me up. This is like this is like long after I pretty much got sidetracked and ended up not riding anymore. But he was like, "Dude, I got this bad," and he was like competing at the time. He's like, "What do you do?" And I'm like. Trying to get all psychological with them, dude. It's in your head, man. You gotta, you gotta love it, dude. You got to just drinking at the time. I mean, you just gotta love what you do, man. You can't think about anything else, dude. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's like it's so many people. Joel Alamo had it when we like when I got back. The first thing that when I got back to the states was uh, because I guess I met Mickey Conti at the at the last Worlds I was at, and she wanted me to do shows. And there's this guy named Joel Alamo. I'm like, I know who Joel Alamo is. 
well, you guys are going to ride together. And then when the first time I met him, he was talking about it too, man. And I think he still gets it every once in a while. I'm not sure. What up, Joel? Fucking hell. But yeah, it's like, it's a prevalent thing. It really is. Yeah, I, I, a lot of people now don't have never heard of it, you know. They, they, don't, they don't know if it even exists. But so it, it happened yeah. on half pipe as well. Yeah, it happened on anything, Bert. Oh, wow. I didn't know it was a half pipe thing as well. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Uh, that's good. I'm glad you uh, we got into that one. Um, oh, yeah. I'm not. Thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> so, so look, like, so you You're wrote it. Bad memories. Yeah, sorry. I, I just had what? to. I, that was a, a personal one for me. I, I really, when I remembered it, like, not so long ago, I was like, man, I'd love to know about that. But, um, yeah, right on. Yeah. Uh, so, you you rode the worlds over here. Was that the the, the Tizer worlds, the the touring one? Was it? Yeah, that was awesome. I love that. They were like, I don't know how we all, how they scheduled all that. It, like it was, all the guys in charge, like Peter Noble and all them. They they did a really fantastic job. Do you think? But you take it for granted then. But now it's like they bust us around place to place. Had to you know had to rent out the gymnasiums or whatever the sporting centers. Yeah. To, to get us to ride, and then man, that's pretty. That's a pretty awesome job, and it was cool because so many people came over from, you know, people from France and people from the states. And it was a real world championship. So. Yeah, I remember it was a it was a tour. They toured it all the way around the UK, right? Because I went to one in Woking. Yeah. Hoffman was there, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I remember that. So I think the first one, the first one was also coincided with BMX beat. Because I remember it was like, it was just the worlds, but then like the finals was, you know, in, oh, yeah, right. was there announcing. So, so that was international yeah. BMXB. I watched that recently. You was on that. Yeah. Yeah, dude, that was, there's, <laughs> I think I told you this before. There's like two videos out there of me that I actually like. The rest are just crap. And some of them are from the BMXB. I think the one that I like was in Gloucester. That's where I'm riding John Pova's bike. And I did a, it was a really good run. I think I had gotten, I'd ordered my Haro Sport. Everyone said I was sponsored by Haro. I, I did some circus shows with Canning that, that, you know, I got some wheels, basically. But I was never sponsored by them until, like, over here I did some stuff. But um, I got my bike, I'd ordered it, and it was the only bike that I'd never been comfortable with. I guess it's the head angle was so different or something. I could ride anyone's bike on any ramp, and it was fine. But that, so I'm thinking the way it happened was, John, I rode John's bike because my bike was out of commission for some reason. And then when my bike arrived, I didn't even get to practice it. I had to do my, my, that it was the finals day, right? And so, like, if you watch the BMXB video, I'm all over the place, dude. My first air, like, I nosedive and then I, like, almost run into the crowd and kill some kid. And then it's like I did an alley oop, uh, and over the channel and, like, like, crash that. It's like I couldn't even ride, dude. So I got, so I had that going for me and the Sam Wood. Whole shot disaster. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't think the BMX beat looked. My I, I didn't think that run looked that bad, to be honest. Alley oop over the channel back then was quite a big move, and you did it high as well. So, yeah. They, but you was on the sport well, then, yeah. I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that those videos, I'm, but, I'm, I'm on the sport, and but, I had the before I found the Haro knee savers, which are to this day still my favorite bars. I had the the other bars with the kind of. The U shaped loop, whatever. Yeah, the, the, pre the original. Yeah. Or as large as the Tenover was a fan of. Even look right, right now. You see the, can you see the. Yeah, I see him. Yeah, the knee savers. Yeah. That's, uh, those are Hara, those are Hoffman, Hoffman drag bars because I couldn't get a hold of knee savers. It's the closest I could find. It's yeah, like, yeah, I see it. They stay, they, they, yeah, they, they've been making them bars since the knee savers stopped, I think, Hoffman. So, but you won yeah. that. You won that BMX beat, though. Um, yeah, I won, but then they did an they did an they did an overall like all the different age group winners competed against each other and didn't do so well at that. I, I think it was yeah, yeah, I ran against Matt. I remember Gary McCallion, rest in peace, saying, "Come on, man, you can do this, man. You can take Matt. Just give it, give it your all." Of course, I couldn't take Matt, but uh, I, yeah, I was riding terribly, and I think it was like Matt was first and Scott Carroll. Yeah, again, RIP. Love that dude so much. Um was second and then I came in third I was so disappointed and it's like I, it was that bike I wanted so badly I wanted the sport so badly and then I couldn't it took me forever to get used to it but you, you had that bike for a while though yeah um I think like I said I think during the 
during that first round that I was bikeless for a small period of time. That's why I ended up riding Povas in one of the qualifying rounds in Gloucester. And then the, when the sport came in, I wasn't used to it at all. And it showed. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. So I'm, I'm a stickler for that. I'm a perfectionist. I hate when I, I hate when I fail, dude. It's like, if I if I don't land perfectly down the down the vert, I failed. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm hard on myself. Forgive me. No, no, so it's all right, man. You got your standards. It's hot. They're high, weren't they? That's all. Um, so, so did you meet Ruffle? Um, I don't. I never met Neil. Um, but Andy Ruffle, I, that I BMX beat. I, I spoke briefly with Andy. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, he might have done a little BMX side interview with me or something. All right. Yeah, I just wondered what that guy was like. Um, so he seemed like he seemed like a really cool dude, man, and he's like a legend in the UK. He seems and, like. Uh, but why, why do so many people talk smack about him? That was so why so many people talk smack about people back in the day, dude. I never understood that. Like, shut up, get on your bike and ride, dude. Why are you talking smack? I, I, I've he's a cool dude. I've spoke to him recently on Facebook, and uh, yeah, he seems cool. He he yeah he he contacted me about something on Facebook, and he yeah he seemed like a nice dude. I mean, back then I, I was yeah, hating yeah. on him, but like not now, yeah. I think he just <laughs> he just fuck he, he was so bad at the commentary, so so a lot of people hated him for that. <laughs> But we was 15. Like. Well, he was all right, man. He was loud. He was yeah. loud, semi-abrasive, but he knew what he was talking about. But Not we was kind of, right? Yeah, we were kids and we just wanted we wanted to be angry, you know? That was that was it, wasn't it? <laughs> so, so, so you was local at Latimer Road, right? You must have some stories about that because that was like, that was just the place that nobody went to. Like we went once, I think. Um, what was, I mean, there was a story with the Bones Brigade. That was that was that was awesome. Um, I, I remember it just being like a real like gnarly area, like gypsies and and just robbers, basically. Yeah, literally, literally like thirty feet from the ramp was like the whole um, the whole caravan scene. I didn't want to use a derogatory term. The whole <laughs> the whole uh, caravan scene was right there, and they come up. I mean, it, I never had an issue there. I had issues at Niwa One, but never never there. I mean. Those guys would come over and they'd watch us, and they were, they seemed pretty cool. They weren't trying to like you know steal anything from us or anything, but um, there was yeah, I, I I never had any issues with Vladimir Road except they put a every once in a while they put a big fat chain across the ramp, but you just funny hop over it because it wasn't that big. Oh, yeah, it was like a like an anchor chain. I remember it as being huge. Hey, I mean. Body hop like four or five inches in between areas. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, like, who did you used to ride there with, just on your own? Well, no, I just uh, no. I usually go with the Chizik crew. Okay, like James and James Shaka Stewart. Condi a lot with me. Condi as well. He was part of that crew, wasn't he? James, yeah. Con- oh, that's who you're talking about, yeah. Yeah. No, Mark. Sorry. Mark. Mark. His name's Mark Condon, right? Oh, Mark Condon. I thought you said James. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, Mark. Mark was Mark and Church. I think I met Shaq before I met Mark and Church, and hung out with them a lot. Mark did go there. Um, I don't know where that guy went, dude. There's people we got to find, man. I need to know where Mark Condon is. He, I need to know where Jason Webb is. Find Jason Webb. Jason Mark, Webb dude. might be easier easier to find than uh than yeah. I know that Con- Condi's uh he lives in like Thailand or somewhere. He contacted me in the last few years. Oh, right on. I used to hang out with him a bit, yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was just, yeah, that 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 local crew. And there's uh, there are other dudes from Chiswick. There's like Gerald. You see little Gerald Roach. He would come out there and skate. He dropped in on that. He was the, the Gerald, I mean, he was like, you know, four feet tall. The dude was tiny, and he's dropping in on Latimer Road. That's pretty badass. But, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was a fine area. Uh, that's where I – Started getting a better groove on for half pipes. I mean, it did all right at Chingford, but it got a lot better at Latimer. And Latimer's probably the last place I rode before moving back here. Yeah, it didn't last lot much longer after. I don't think it was early nineties that was gone. Yeah. Why, man? Did the city take it down? Um, I don't really know what happened, but vert skating, you know, it just died a death, didn't it? So it was around that time. So yeah. I guess no one used it. So. Right on. But um, yeah, like so. So you also you you um, arranged a jam at Chinkford with Tim Ruck. Yeah, yeah, that that was that was kind of cool. It was different. It was um, 
Tim approached me and he said, Hey, I'm, I want to do this, this, uh, you know, this half five jam series, like kind of like equivalent to two hip, but in the UK. And, um, hey, you want to do it with me? And I'm like, sure. Why not? And so, I mean, he, Tim did all the, Tim set up all the work. I think I might've done, I felt weird though. Like in the, the one contest that, that first contest that we held, like being riding in my own contest, you know what I mean? So you yeah. didn't question the, the authenticity of the judging or something, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, and uh, I think I did some announcing for it as well. But that was pretty badass. It, it wasn't a huge turnout. Ellis was there; he fucking kicked ass. Um, a lot of people there. Graham Marfley, and then and then Shaw was like busting five forties on the little undervert section, like super high. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was that was that was all rock, man. That was all rock. So, so was that just you only did one event, or was there two? Well, I think, or was Crawley? I think there was just that one. Um, I don't know what happened afterwards because that, that was like right before I left. I'm pretty sure that was right before I left to come back here. Yeah, that was 88. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was right before I came back. So so the Crawley Jams, they wasn't part of that, no? No. Um, no, that was completely separate. I don't know how that – that was at a time where that I just broke in my collarbone and it had been a couple weeks and – I heard there was a jam. Lee, actually, that's a weird story. I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but there was somebody who wasn't a fan of mine that helped put it together and didn't want me there. And so Lee Reynolds ended up calling me and dude, there's a jam. I'm not supposed to tell you, but why don't you come out? And so, like, I was riding with a broken collarbone, and it was it was it was a weird feeling. And for someone who, who has a half pipe contest when you can't get more than four feet because of the fucking ceiling, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. there was the quarter outside and canning was blasting air so that made it all the better yeah yeah i remember those yeah, yeah. but I, I, he, had, he had some great pictures on them quarter pipes actually um so so what about the i've i've heard a story of a quarter pipe that you made in or, or people you and your friends made in uh acton park or somewhere yeah, over there man. Yeah, that was actually, uh, they made it, man. They made it. They, um, uh, I think it was the neighborhood kids. I know um, that's where Shaq and Church lived, like literally right across the street. And um, yeah, there was a, there was like this little tiny, like four foot tall, like mini ramp quarter. And then there was uh, almost an exact replica of the meanwhile ramp on the other side. So it was kind of like the Hounslow situation. Oh, okay. On, on dirt and with uh, plywood on the ground as your instead of concrete, and yeah, yeah, good times there. Did some practicing, did some riding, but that was that was pretty much already there when I was introduced to it. Oh, that was already so. So that was someone else's spot already, I guess, right? Yeah, it was. A, it was like a little community thing. I think it was next to some kind of like community center, and then they just stick the ramps in there in like the little squared off gated park section. Um, okay, so. So then you moved back to the U.S. Yeah, like that was '88, yeah. Yeah, that was um, as soon as like I said, I already talked to Mickey, and I was anticipating meeting with Joel and stuff. But the first thing I did getting back to the states was um, a Washington D.C. two hit right before that was obviously before I went pro. That was riding amateur. Um, hadn't ridden for a little bit. See, look at me making excuses again. But no, no, road okay. But um, yeah, so I did the Washington thing, and then I ended up uh, bailing on my flight back, and I ended up riding with Lee Reynolds um, with uh, the whole trailer two hip setup. He was going to California, dropped me off in Texas. But that was the first thing I did when I got back to the states. And how, how was that? Like riding with all those American guys? It was very cool because it wasn't like it was just it was it was cool because it's like okay now I'm in the states. So when I was in England, it's like. You know, I'm sure it was like that across the world. Like the the Americans were the were the you know the American pros like uh, Mike and Brian and Ron and all and Eddie and all them. Josh, there was like they were the gods, you know. And it's just a weird situation. Like, oh wow, look, I'm in America, and it's weird because I never felt like being an American. I never felt like it. Like I've always told you know my friends in the UK, it's like I always consider myself a UK rider because that's where I you know got better and went to the level that I got to. Yeah, long before the states, and 
Yeah, man. Yeah, I was cool, and I, I did some two hips. And my, my my first pro contest, I think, was a two hip in uh, Colorado Springs. I can't. I, I don't know if I remember that one. But so, so how many of those contests did you ride? The two hip ones. I think only only three. Um, the first one was that Washington one I mentioned in, as amateur, then the, the pro in Colorado. And then as, and you're probably going to ask me about this, you're going to bring up negative shit again. <laughs> 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 but uh, the, the third one was in Arizona, and I hadn't ridden for a long time. And just on a whim, we kind of went. And uh, I think I think those might be the only three that I wrote. Yeah. So was the Arizona one the one with the – the big, like, Vision Streetwear boards at the back. Oh, I'm not sure, man. I know it's called Thrasherland. The one with the board oh, in the back, okay. the, the one that I remember with the scoreboard in the back was Colorado Springs. And that's right. where um, everyone started getting nicknames because whoever was working the board, for whatever rider came down, you know, for their run, they put a nickname up there. And that's the first time I remember them ever saying Condor. In fact, I think they might have, that might have been the first time they put his name on the on the board as Condor, and then they put Guillotine for me. <laughs> I think they were just bored and making other names, but he's stuck. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, though. <laughs> so, so you you rode like a couple of AFA contests as well. Yeah, I did. I did a lot of um, local contests, and um, then I did uh, the pro. I, when I was pro, I did uh, AFA. Austin 89. Yeah, that's online, right? I, I think it was me and me. And, yeah, yeah. I think me and Joel were like the only two pros there. This was, I guess, when everything started declining. So when, so when you also, when you moved back to Texas, you built that quarter pipe? Well, I built a, um, I built a half pipe in that the was backyard. A, so that was a half pipe. seen some pictures because you did some digging. Yeah, no, I've seen uh, pictures, yeah. But, um, yeah, that was that was a half pipe. It was uh, ten feet tall, twelve feet wide, and then eventually built a six foot tall, eight foot section, eight foot wide section next to it. And then on the other side of that, directly connected to it, was another ten foot tall, twelve foot wide half. So towards the end of my whole riding situation, I was doing, you know, I get a big air on one side, and then I canyon over the eight foot. Uh, mini session back onto the other quarter pipe and then just play around alley ooping, canyoning, whatever. Oh, wow. Gap. I think my friend Bill Schroeder, what up, Bill? It's got some footage of that, so there were pictures. Oh, you've got but, footage uh, of that? Huh? You've got, I didn't realize there was video footage. I've seen the pictures, like the ludicrous pictures, like no pads, these shorts and stuff, like Indian Airs, like 10 feet. Yeah, there's, there's a, there's, I did a, I did a, um, a sponsor me tape for Hammer. Basically, because I wanted hammer shit pads for free, <laughs> so I did. A, I did a hammer video, and it had Flatland, and it had it had um, some early shots of that ramp, and it shows. It, 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 at the very end of the video, it's got footage of the um, the other side of the the second half. Okay, it's all the big one big ramp, but the but the newer section. I think there's a quick canyon from one from one to the other. Did, did you get the shin pads? Did no, you? man. I, I, I don't think we ever sent the video out. <laughs> but, but Bill had the footage, so I think I, I, I uploaded it a few years ago. He found the footage, and I put it up online. So it's out there. I think someone, yeah, someone, I can't remember who who interviewed me, but they they uh, put it up and thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'd like, it, it, it interspliced between Flatland and, and ramp riding, I'm doing like backflips on swings, <laughs> or wall riding, wall riding the embankment at the local mall. <laughs> and what, who used to ride that ramp? I know Joe Alamo. You used to ride with a bit, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Joel would come out my way every once in a while, ride the half in the back, and then I, he had a he had an old at his place. He had an old um, AFA quarter pipe. That's where he practiced. All right. Yeah, I remember because Ga yeah. Gary McCallion, he came to stay with you, didn't he? And he he told me when he came back that, about yeah. Joel Alamo because yeah. I didn't really Gary, know who Gary he was. Came a couple times, man. Yeah, I, I, I thought people. Huh? 
few people came to stay, man. Yeah, John. Again, Jason Webb. Where Where are you, Jason Webb? But Jason Webb came to stay with you as well. Oh yeah. All right. I think Jason Webb might still be like in, somewhere in the Romford area. I heard he was making kites. He, he was making kites, right? Yeah. Did you hear that? Yeah. Well, no. See, I was I was looking for him like how was it like ten years ago or something? And I guess it got out, and I got this message from this dude saying, "Yeah, I'm Jason." And I make kites now. And I thought it was just like someone trolling me. But I guess it was really him. And then it's like I lost contact with him again. It's like, come on, dude. Yeah, that, that's the same story I heard that he, he makes kites. Yeah, so I guess there must be some merit to it. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, crazy. Yeah, I see. Uh, I, I see. Um, we interviewed Phil Dolan for the, for the meanwhile thing. So I think he cool. he might even know where. Dylan Lincoln, man, they, yeah, he might know where Webby is. Uh, connected with him. So, uh, so then, then you ended up right. Is this around about the time that you ended up riding for Mickey Conti? Okay, Mickey. Yeah, Mickey was like as soon as I got back to the states. Okay, I got back to the states. Like right after the after the Washington two hit, it was get together with Joel, hang out, get to know each other, and then go on the road. So we'd ride around with Mickey in her like nineteen seventy six fucking station wagon. And, uh, and dude, you know, I never got paid for a single show, which is kind of, which is cool. Cause like, I never did it for the money. Like there wasn't any money back then anyway. Right. But always for the love of riding and just getting to travel around, hang out in hotel rooms, go do shows, meet chicks, stuff like that. But, um, man, she's like, she, <laughs> Joel brought it up first. It was like, we were like, like 10 shows in. He's like, dude, have you got any money? He's like, no. <laughs> it's like, so then eventually Tying into Jason Webb, Jason Webb came to stay, and dude, man, he he got good. He got so good. Like I, he was already good, but then when he started doing this, like he jump into a rope roni and like just like go spastic with it, and, like amazing. He like he clicked at one point, just got really good. But um, he uh, where was I again? <laughs> uh, you was you was um you was doing Mickey Conti shows with Jason oh, Webb. Yeah, 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 and um, so. Um, he was, he was, um, he was, he was with me. Mickey came to visit my house where I had the big ramp in the back and she was trying to like hint at my mom. She needs a place to stay. And she kept hinting for two hours. And my mom was the whole time like, Oh, well, you know, there's this motel down the street, all this stuff. And, um, I asked her about, uh, it turns out she's just like really good at bargaining. If you want to put it that way. Um, Mickey was, I mean, we go into a, we go into a bike shop because I needed new wheels or something. And, and they'd be like, what are you talking about? We're not giving you wheels. And then two hours later, she'd come out with a pair of wheels. <laughs> it was pretty freaking amazing what she could do, but she never paid us. So, um, <laughs> Webby was there. I think he came to visit twice. And the second time he came, uh, Mickey called to speak to him. And or no, she was speaking, she called me first. And then she's like, you want to do some more shows? I'm like, well, you know, you never paid me. And then it quickly became to, it became, let me speak to Jason. <laughs> so that was the last time I spoke to Mickey. And then Jason said, yeah, I'll do some shows, but you got to pay me up front. And she did pay him up front. He did some shows for Mickey. Oh, wow. So I he got paid. I don't remember where, but he ended up taking leaving the house. And I don't know if she picked him up or what, but he was gone doing shows for her for a while. So so where did you, what was her background? How did she end up doing BMX stuff? Dude, I, I don't know. I mean, the first I heard of her was when um, Joe and Dennis were yeah, the Adidas. with the Adidas uniforms. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, so I, I mean, they're gods, right? So yeah. when Mickey, who was, was managing them calls you and says, Hey, you want to ride for me? You're like, Oh hell yeah. I get to be on that elite level. Cause I ride for Mickey now, you know, yeah. but it just turned into, a, I mean, I, I would never, I mean, I, I don't even, I, I just bring up the fact that we didn't get paid because it's just weird that I would have ridden that long and done that many shows and never even asked, you know, it was just about the riding and I got to see tons of places. But I just, I mean, you hear stories, you even ask Dennis and Joe, man, like he was just kind of a shyster about, she would just never pay anybody and keep all the, keep all the cash. But it was badass. Tons yeah. of NWA, NWA on the road trips in her, in her ancient station. Like, <laughs> <and Joel. laughs> I know. I think Carlo did some shows for her as well at one point. Oh, really? Yeah. 
But yeah, so she's yeah. renowned for uh, not paying people. Did you ever see the video of her yeah. riding the bike on the ramp and slamming? Right, that was quite famous. Yeah, that's like end of, end of one of the Dorkin in York videos. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I remember seeing it. I didn't remember yeah. what it was. Oh man, classic. All right, what else we got? <laughs> so yeah, and then you ended up on the cover of Go. It's so strange, man. Okay, so so um, you disappeared for a few it, years or a year or so, right? It seemed yeah, fr it from a, view. It was circumstances. What it was was that combination of things like the ramp. My my parents moved into a little subdivision house with no backyard. Well, a tiny backyard, and so the ramp was gone. So we moved the ramp to Terrell, but Terrell, Texas, is like an hour drive from where I was living then, and so there wasn't a whole lot of riding going on. Like, dude. It, you're spoiled in England, dude. I was spoiled in England. You can just jump on a, a tube or get on your bike and you've got something right around the corner. It's like that nowadays anyway, but, but it, it was skate parks all around the place. But it wasn't back then, not here. Everything's like, you know, 10, 20 miles away or more. And uh, Terrell was like, we, we took most of the ramp out to Terrell and um, we built it there, but didn't get to ride. Then I started, and I'm going to throw Joel under the bus. He was like, I mean, his thing was like drinking 40s. So he pretty much introduced me to drinking. So there was a combination of getting involved with drinking, which got me over my shyness so I could actually talk to girls for once, which I've never been able to do. I mean, I was 18 years old going on 12, dude, I swear to God. And uh, so there was nowhere to ride and then the drinking. And then it just slowly became more of the drinking and less of the riding until the riding didn't exist. But whenever I did go to Terrell, you know, it was still muscle memory and everything. I wasn't, at that point, wasn't progressing anymore. Um, just riding to ride. And my friend Robert Rounceval, he, uh, he somehow got a hold of Freestyle or something. He spoke with those guys. And so they sent Matt and Rick Thorne and Spike Jones to, to take pictures. And congrats on your Oscar, Spike. Jerk. Anyway. And, um, <laughs> no, I think that's awesome, dude. Him and David Slade, too. Yeah, that's right. it. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And uh, so they came out, and they did, like like any other photo shoot, you're not really aware. You just, you know, you don't really, well, I didn't really think about it. And then end up getting, like, the cover, you know, and then getting that that full page shot inside of that turndown where my friend Mondo is totally overdoing it. I'm, like, only, like, six or seven feet out. And my friend Mondo's on the rib looking up, like, I'm 20 feet out. <laughs> I think that might have sold the picture oh, when that, I chose it. That was a fucking great picture, though. That, that was a, that's a real memorable photo that one yeah and the cover shot actually I got that growl I got the growl face <laughs> yeah it's fucking that's a good one no, no brakes as well I remember that like being significant at that point in time like whoa it's got no brakes on his bike yeah, that's another thing that people bring up so much so many years later like decades later like if they see that picture like someone every, eventually you know every couple of years someone will find it and post it and then you get all the comments like and it was brakeless look at that no brakes dude it's because there were no brakes on the bike. That's all. You know what I mean? It was just like this piece of bike that was piece of parts that just fit together to make a bike so there's something to ride and just didn't happen to be brakes because they broke her. Who knows? I wasn't even thinking about it. Yeah, it's still, hey, it still I'll, makes the picture better. Credit. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. So, so, how, so how did you end up getting into like the metal scene? Like the, cause you guys were all into this, like, like the good, the good music, what I can see is still consider good music. Like you, Andy Brown, Jason Hassel, like all these these guys that were riding that I looked up to all li listened to like cool music that was way better than like what was going on everywhere else, I think. Dude, it was just a preference. Like when I was young, my mom would drive around and she'd be playing like Kenny Rogers and Ann Murray and all these like easy listening rock stuff. And But it was all just all mellow. And then the first time I ever heard like distorted guitars basically was kiss and this was still when i was in plano before i went to holland so like seven years old i hear kiss and i'm like oh my god and then they got the makeup and like oh my god it's the most awesome thing ever so that's how i first got into, got into metal and then it just um progressed the funny thing about getting into metallica was um i would just go into a store a record store and i know what metal albums were because of their their um the sleeve or not the sleeve but the, the cover yeah of the, of the of the album and i saw ride the lightning and i'm like oh my god that looks cool so i wasn't even into it on the first album but i saw ride the lightning and then i listened to it oh dude oh my god yeah and then so then it just progressed because then you hear about 
peer bands like you know like Megadeth and stuff like that. And then the the lyrics were cool too. I was also into Maiden big time right before Metallica. Huge Maiden fan, always will be. Took my my daughters when they were twelve and eight years old, front row in Dallas. Anyway, <laughs> so so you just. And, um, so you just slotted right. into like the the scene that the other guys were into, like just well, naturally. I, just, I, I don't think anyone ever like influenced each other's music. It's just we, we happened to be into that. Yeah, it was, that, it was basically Metallica, Anthrax, and uh, Megadeth. Yeah, the, the, I, know, I know, I know. Mr. Andrew Brown was was big time. I went to a concert. I went to a Megadeth concert with him in, at the Hammer Smithsonian. How was that? I was badass. I was badass. <laughs> Except for the opening band. I think the opening band was Sanctuary or something, and Dave Mustaine was like the producer for them. And they had one album, maybe. And they all had like the same, they all had like, like hair, the same blonde hair down to their butts. And then they do this coordinated headbang thing. And I'm like, oh my God, this is cheesy. But then Megadeth came on. So <laughs> nice. What, what was that? Like 87 or something? Yeah, that's got to be around 87. It might have been actually 88. I don't know. I know 88 was like my last year there, so it's close to that. Nice. <clears throat> so uh, so could you see the decline in, um, in in BMX riding when you was in the UK? Could you see the like the decline of of what was going on, or was you just no, in it? not in the UK. No? Not in the UK at all. I think I noticed it first when I came back here. It was in the UK, it was still, it felt super strong. It felt super strong, and if I had the if I had the the foresight to to have, to have been able to make the decision to stay in England, I would have stayed in England. But like I said, I was eighteen going on twelve, so like, oh, mommy and daddy are moving, I have to go with them, you know. So when they moved back here, I went with them. But if I'd stayed there, dude, everything would have been completely yeah, different. Yeah, who knows? What, yeah. Different. So it's one thing like you you're not supposed to regret anything. But I definitely regret that. I should have stayed there because I would have kept riding. I wouldn't have gotten involved with bullshit, and it would have continued. And because because the scene is so hardcore there, it was yeah. so tight knit. I mean, you guys were putting on contests left and right. I mean, outside of the whole UK BFA thing, you were still having these jams all the time, and everyone lives fairly close to one another, you know. And there's always a scene, and dude, that's like um, it's a, like it, it never. It didn't seem to die, at least in my head, because I was gone after that and didn't know. But it seemed like it would always be close and tight like that. Um, but then coming over here, like you really don't see any people until you go to, to to like contests and stuff. And then there would be less and less people, and it just seemed to. So that was like another factor too, besides my the bullshit I was putting myself through. It was also it was just kind of dying off. And then, but then I guess X Games came along and saved everything. Yeah, that that was a few years after that. You know, it 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 did die here like big time. Yeah, like completely. It, really? it was yeah. There was like there was me, Gary, Zach. Like yeah, and they, that that was all that was it from like the near vicinity. You know, there was there was us three really who rode because everyone either yeah. took up skateboarding or just quit riding, and then we'd go to South Bank and then we'd see Adju or there'd be like a couple of others. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it, it got really did, small, uh, huh? When did the UK? When did the, the the BFA die off? The BFA kept going for quite some time, but it wasn't arranging like sports hall contests. It it would help jams arrange the judging and the score sheets, and they still had an active role for a long time. It was a a guy called Diane, a a, a woman called Diane Winfield, and her husband was Roy Winfield. They probably was th- was about when you was about, but they basically got they, they took it and run with it for a bit. So it went until like probably nine. They were still around in, in like mid nineties, probably ninety four, ninety five. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I thought they died off way before then. Then I thought they died off in the early nineties just because everything else was dying off. But the, the, not us. I'm glad they kept it going. The all all the people like the, like uh, who was in it had died off. It was just left to them too. Like husband and wife uh, crew, yeah. Who, they, who was the guy with the sideboard? That was Willie something, right? I'm not sure. I remember Colin I Kefford. Like the judges and organizers. Yeah, I only remember Colin Kefford and uh, Peter Noble and uh, Peter Hawkins. Oh yeah. He, he was he was a name yeah. as well. 
he stayed in it for a while. But yeah, he, he gets a bit of a bad rep, but I don't know anything about him really. Yeah, no, I had a, I, he, he shouldn't have gotten that bad rep. I had a, at the, the recent Woodward reunion in California, um, Tabron showed up and like, you know, they're like, oh my God, brother, what's up, dude? We, you know, we hadn't seen each other for fucking ever. And that was awesome. And he asked me, he was, he, his brain works so wonderfully. He asked me questions about certain scenarios with certain people and Hawkins was one of them. And he vouched, he vouched for Hawkins, like not right. being what people said he was. So. Yeah, yeah. I Good redemption. Yeah, I, I figured that he wasn't that guy. He just got a bad rep. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like tough shit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like what I was saying. Like, that scene was such young, angry kids. They, they wanted a reason to dislike people. You know, it was it was a bad time for a lot of people like, being that age, you know, and right. having having adults to, like, point your anger at, like. That was bound to happen. Yeah. Um, so, so you wrote like, this. Like now, if you ever hear the, if you ever hear uh, "Summer of '69" by Brian Adams again, you want to punch the person who's playing it, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That was the most overplayed song ever. At every UK be a thing, and you walk in, that song's playing. It plays a hundred times, and then when you walk out, it's still playing. <laughs> I, I remember. I remember Every one. UK be a thing writer knows what I'm talking about. I remember one BFA contest you wrote at. Um, and they said you was riding to a, a band called Metal Liquor. Do you remember that one? No. All right. Yeah. Me and Gary. What, they, what they, they mispronounced Metallica? Yeah. It was Greg Gilotti riding for Metal riding to Metal Liquor. It was me, me and Gary yeah. used to love that one. Yeah. I don't know if I've mentioned this before when you, with, the, with the Meanwhile project you got going on. Um, Nick Howard, a.k.a. Howard, had um, – I think I did tell you. He had a. Uh, he he wanted me to write a porn music. I don't know how we came up with that idea, but so he's like he just plays a porn and then he records the music to tape. And it's like it's like it's like oh, oh ride him cowboy and this porn music in the background. And I rode to that at a contest. That was when I could barely ride because I was laughing so hard the whole time. That was the one where they had a they had the pillar between the ramps and I did a foot plant over the canyon. That was probably the one thing that I remember the best besides the porn music. <laughs> I don't. I don't think I was at that one. I was at one where someone wrote to Weird Science, right? What was that? I don't know. I mean, didn't Craig write all the Craig? Craig wrote the everything on your phone Okay. The, uh, a lot of the Skyway team members followed suit. All they, right. They yeah, I remember that. I remember that song being of something, something going on there. Yeah. So, so you wrote the, you wrote the circus with with a uh, cannon. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, that was. Uh, the Hippodrome Circus, I believe. I can't remember what town it was. One of those seafront towns. And, like, one dude owned it all or something. But yeah, the dude that owned the circus owned, like, like half everything on the pier or the beachfront there. And so we get to go to the movies for free. We get to go to clubs for free. I mean, I didn't drink back then. So. What, was that in the UK? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So that was just before you left for the, for the US or earlier? Yeah, that was just, just before as well. Did that for a summer. And it was uh, it was awesome, man. Because not, I mean, the experience of riding in a circus, yeah, that's cool. And then you get to tell your kids, hey, you know, I rode in a circus. That's that's neat. But it was it was the thing I remember is playing seven twenty, Atari seven twenty. Yeah, I remember it. Arcade cabinet and meeting all the people in the circus because I mean they live such unique lives. You know what I mean? Because they they do that for a living type deal. We're just like we're just like fill-ins because they needed an app or something. But with all these other people, that's what they do for a living, and they're you know the best at it yeah uh, how long was that for a summer like okay three months two or three months okay nice i know david beverage came down and hung out for a little while and then i i hurt my knee or something i had to leave for a couple months and uh james hudson filled in for my spot for that time all right yeah yeah oh nice so so then so what did you do after you like you quit riding for quite a while, right? In the in the states. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. So so, and then I remember someone seeing you at an X Games. Maybe was it? Hey, dude, no, no. Like, oh, I mean, not to ride or anything. no, no, no. That like, yeah, but you just yeah, you were just there. Like you you rode the ramp yeah, or no, something. Yeah, it, was, it was in Austin. It's like a two hour drive. Oh, okay. So I just figured I'd go down there, hang out, 
I didn't, I didn't try to weasel my way in. You know, I'm an ex pro. Let me see. <laughs> I just kind of, I, I paid my ticket. I sat in the stands and I enjoyed it. All right. Like everyone else. Well, it's crazy that that yeah that that's, that that news travelled yeah it's travelled far because I, I heard that story. So it's, that's weird. It's so weird. It was just a day out at the X Games. That's funny. So, so have you have you been on a vert ramp since the early nineties or? Well, there's some bowls around here. Um, there's a skate park in Frisco, which is about thirty minutes away. And they've got like deep, like 12, 13 foot bowls. So the, the, the bowl in the back is like 12, 13 feet deep. It might be 14. It's got a couple feet of vert. And then they got like a, uh, this carapace thing. It's like this big, you know, where you can, like, it's not the full bowl, but it's the, it's the little pocketed section that you cradle. can kind of go upside down. Yeah. Yeah, cradle, yeah. Sure. I don't know the technical oh. of the skate park that <laughs> yeah, these days. That's it. <laughs> so, yeah, but you... Your carapace, I don't know. The, I don't so, know what Tombstone is. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you've been riding, because I saw some fo- some video of you on, on Facebook, maybe. Yeah, um, there's also the Rockstar Energy Skate Park in Houston. I stay, I go down and stay with my friend Troy Tyro. Troy. And um, he's got like a half in his backyard. That's kind of torn down right now. Got some damage from floods they had but there's rockstar energy park which is pretty badass there's no vert there is one um section that's like it's a quarter pipe up to a pillar and the pillar just keeps going up 20 feet so i was doing the like, turnaround airs on that but um yeah and, and it's free too so anybody you know makes their way to houston it's a massive park with a professional bmx track it's got a flatland session like i'm not you know like i'm sponsored by them or something i'm not it's a really cool park <laughs> you should definitely check it out it's free it's completely free you sign up for a membership for free and you're good to go but cool. you gotta wear a helmet fuckers still don't like a helmet no <laughs> so so what, you, so so what are you doing now it like what what's what's your life in town these days dude man i've just been working like shitty jobs um well, like four years ago, and this is so boring, I started like trying to trade stocks and then eventually cryptos. And now I'm trying to get into like this whole NFT craze thing. And it's, uh, I've been saving up money doing that. And eventually the goal is to like buy a house and have another massive half pipe in the back of it. And then I could die happy. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're still going for the half pipe. Yeah. Oh yeah, dude. Fuck yeah, man. That's good to hear. <laughs> Impressive. Yeah, I know some for life, man. I mean, I took, a, I took, I take breaks all the time. I got out of it, but I never quit. You know what I mean? I quit being competitive because, you know, you let something go for more than six months, you're falling behind progression wise. But, you know, I still take my kids to the skate park and we'll go down to Houston and, uh, I'll ride for two, three months straight. Then I'll take another six months off. But I mean, it's always there. Still inside. Yeah. Yeah. Forever. That's nice, man. All right, man. Well, I think that's a. Uh, I'm, I'm good with that. If you're good with that, yeah, dude, I'm cool. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks very much, Greg. Thanks for sparing the time. <laughs>